a very good afternoon to everyone and a very warm welcome uh, to all listeners uh, today is a special day because normally uh, we see dr navin malhotra sir welcoming uh, all the iscns and all the listeners for this isc online pg class today sir it is a proud privilege to welcome you and a very very warm welcome uh, for this isc online pg class uh, i will take this opportunity today sir to thank you and the isa in general and you in particular uh, for starting these isa online pg classes which i'm sure uh, is very very beneficial for all post graduates and uh, uh, i'm sure i will be joined by the post graduates in thanking you uh, for initiating these pg classes so uh, obviously dr navin malhotra sir does not need any introduction and it is my absolute proud privilege there could not be any more What a privilege for me then to introduce Navin Malhotra sir. Sir is our secretary of the ISA, and he is a postgraduate P, uh, MD and DNB. He has got fellowships in pain management. He is a senior professor in anesthesiology and heading the pain management center at PGIMS Rohtak, Haryana. He won the ISA Bhopal Award for academic excellence in 2015. he won the kpr young anesthesiologist national award in 2009 he has more than 195 publications and more than 392 presentations at various forum he has uh, his original work in submento tracheal and retromolar intubation and uh, the achievement he is our secretary isa national uh, I, indian society of anesthesiology national headquarters So a very warm welcome, sir. And sir will be discussing about uh, what the postgraduates need to know about uh, chronic pain management. Sir, as always, uh, all the speakers, all the audience, and all the listeners will be muted while the presentation by sir is going on. They are all encouraged to ask their questions in the chat box. Our box. And uh, once the uh, talk by sir is over, we will uh, sir will be able to answer all the questions. So over to you, sir. And a very very warm welcome, sir. Uh, thank you, Nishant, for uh, such a kind introduction. And I am myself very happy to amongst the postgraduates uh, uh, talking about chronic pain management. What I should know as a postgraduate of anesthesia. Uh, Nishant, my audio and slides are clear. Yes, sir. Your uh, audio is clear. The slides are visible, sir. Full screen. Full screen. so i last week we had discussions on uh, cancer pain management and today i shall be talking about primarily about uh, non cancer chronic pain and what the nmc and mci defines us in the curriculum and anesthesiology pg should be aware of i bring with myself greetings from my parent institute post graduate institute of medical sciences rota karyana and this is our opd complex where the pain management center is situated last two decades have seen an explosive growth in the scientific study of pain and anesthesiologists taking up pain medicine as a career and becoming the pain physician the implications for be the anesthesiologist are that we can build an exclusive career in pain medicine as we are well versed with the art and science of treating pain and our role as pain physician is a natural extension of our professional work and we can overcome this that we remain majority of time behind the scene and uh, by doing pain practice we can get good interaction with the patients and due recognition by the society so don't worry if you are not where you want to be yet because great things take time so we should not worry why we are not there because sooner or later we'll reach there and great things do take time this is our uh, dard nivaran kendra the pain management center and it's a complex um, uh, having numerous opd two opd complexes and i can say with happiness that we are a busy pain management center and like any other medicine gynae or surgery opd there is a big rush and uh, we see around 150 to 175 patients per opd and perform around 30 to 40 blocks in the pain ot of the pain management center itself 
And on Mondays and Thursdays, we have dedicated pay notice where we do fluoroscope guided blocks. And on Wednesday, USG guided blocks. This is the pain OT of the pain management center. And this is the six bedded recovery room. A big waiting area where 50 to 60 patients can wait at a time. What are the implications for our anesthesiology postgraduates vis a vis chronic pain management? MCI uh, and now NMC has designed a competency based PG training uh, program for MD anesthesiology in September 2019. And it is a carefully drafted. Uh, program wherein the focus, the stress has been laid on what all has to be taught to our anesthesiology postgraduates during the post graduation. So, I'll go what are the questions which come up in the exam and as a short case in the MD exam also. This is the one of the most common uh, question what is the latest definition of pain or what is the IASP, International Association for Study of Pain, definition of pain? and briefly enumerate its notes. ISP has revised its definition of pain in 2020. And it is defined as an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. Unpleasant sensory and emotional experience associated with or resembling that associated with actual or potential tissue damage. And there are six notes to it that pain is always a personal experience that is influenced to a varying degrees by biological, psychological, and social factors. Pain and nociception are different phenomena. Pain cannot be inferred solely from activity in the sensory neurons, which is the nociception. Through their life experiences, all the individuals learn the concept of pain. A person's report of any experience of pain should be respected. We should give due respect to the patient who is saying that I am in pain. Although pain usually serves as an adaptive role, but it can have adverse effects on functioning, day-to-day -day functioning, and social and psychological well-being. And verbal description is only one of the several behaviors to express pain. But sometimes you may not be able to express nicely by verbal mechanism. And inability to communicate does not mean that patient is not in a pain. Some patients may not be able to tell properly geriatric patients or so and so forth or with altered sensorium, but that does not mean that they are not in pain. The second question which commonly comes in theory exams is classify pain and enumerate brief characteristics of different types of pain. Well, I'll just make it simple that if we talk of pain, it can be acute pain that can be following surgery or trauma. It can be a chronic pain, which is of non-cancer origin, and it can be cancer pain. The chronic pain can be further divided into nociceptive pain and neuropathic pain. Neuropathic pain like diatonic neuropathy, post neuralgia, trigonal neuralgia, and nociceptive pain like bone fractures or any joint disease, osteoarthritis, and visceral pain. Uh, which can be related to the structures in the abdomen, dyspepsia, inflammatory bowel syndromes, or gastritis. Nociceptive pain is caused by activity in the neural pathway in response to a potentially tissue damaging stimuli, like, as I was telling, osteoarthritis, low back pain, post op pain, sport injuries, and neuropathic pain is caused by lesion in the Peripheral or central nervous system like post stroke pain, CRPS, neurogenic low back pain, post arthritic neuralgia, and trigonal neuralgia. And if there is combination of both nociceptive and neuropathic pain, which often occurs, it is called as mixed type of pain. Now, this is the definition of classification as per the IASP. So, if you go, it can be divided into seven categories chronic primary pain. Chronic cancer related pain, chronic post surgical or post traumatic pain, chronic neuropathic pain, chronic secondary headache or orofacial pain, chronic secondary visceral pain, and chronic secondary musculoskeletal pain. Though in our day to day practice, this chronic secondary musculoskeletal pain is the most common form 
uh, which 60% of the patients coming to pain clinics form this musculoskeletal pain, whether it is low back pain, disc, facet joint, coxicodynia, osteoarthritis, shoulder joint pain, cervical pain, thoracic pain. But definitely all others do come, uh, if, especially cancer-related pain is our institute is associated with the tertiary care and radiotherapy and cancer care centers. Lots of patients come with post-surgical and post-traumatic pain and definitely chronic neuropathic pain. So let's see uh, how these are there, the seven types. And as I've told you that uh, chronic neuropathic pain can be central or peripheral and peripheral can be uh, post-herpetic neuralgia or trigeminal neuralgia leading on to the peripheral neuropathy leading on to the uh, chronic peripheral neuropathic pain. And cancer pain, though discussed last time, just briefly outlining, it can be a cancer pain or cancer treatment pain, either because of medicine or because of radiotherapy. And most common one which we see is uh, secondary to treatment is chemotherapy induced polyneuropathy. So I'll just recapitulate chronic primary pain, chronic cancer related pain, post surgical and post traumatic pain, neuropathic pain secondary headache or orofacial pain, visceral pain, and musculoskeletal pain. Chronic primary pain is pain in one or more anatomical regions that persists or recurs for longer than three months, associated with significant emotional and functional disability, interference with activities of daily life and participation in social roles, and that cannot be better counted for by any other chronic pain condition. So it's a primary thing, a disease in itself. Rest others are symptoms like the uh, chronic pain, primary pain, it is the primary component. It can be fibromyalgia, complex regional pain syndromes, chronic primary headache or orofacial pain, visceral pain, or musculoskeletal pain. Other categories, the, which are symptoms, chronic cancer-related pain, chronic post-surgical and post-traumatic pain. It can be either post-surgery, post-trauma, chronic neuropathic pain, either because of peripheral neuropathic changes or the central neuropathic cause. And the peripheral includes trigeminal neuralgia, herpetic neuralgia, uh, polyneuropathy, radiculopathy, and central one includes uh, central post stroke pain, injuries following spinal cord, uh, pain following spinal cord or brain injury. Headache. These are very, very common uh, subset coming to us. Uh, tension type headaches, orofacial pains, uh, because of the vascular or non vascular disorders and disorders of the eyes, neck, ears. They come to us. And dental pain, uh, neuropathic orofacial pain, clubbed with trigeminal neuralgia or cranial neuralgias, and TM joint pain. Visceral pain can be because of inflammation, vascular causes, or mechanical factors in any region of the body, head and neck, thoracic, or abdominal. Common one is abdominal pelvic region. And this secondary musculoskeletal pain is the most common one. It can be because of, uh, prominently because of uh, structural changes, the degenerative changes osteoarthritis, spondylosis, musculoskeletal injuries. And also because of the disease of the nervous system. So let's uh, have a quick question, uh, Nishant. Uh, what is not correct about the footnotes of pain? Yes, sir. All the listeners are encouraged to answer this question in their chat box. Uh, which is not correct about the footnotes of pain. Uh, a, pain is always a personal experience. B, pain and nociception are different. C, pain may, be ad may, may have adverse effects on function and social and psychological well-being. And D, verbal description is the only behavior to express pain. Uh, we encourage answers in the chat box, please. We can give them uh, one minute or so. Yes, we can, we can give them one minute. Yes, sir. We'll, we'll have uh, one minute. Uh, we are getting answers on the chat box, sir. Right. Yeah, so most of them have mentioned uh, D. Some have mentioned A and B also. So I I'll, I'll just uh, recapitulate. 
Yes, sir. He is not the correct answer because verbal description is not only the behavior to express pain because uh, at times patient may not be in or maybe an altered sensorium or elderly and may not describe the pain only verbally. So you, it, there can be other descriptions also. We have to holistically see the uh, patient. Yes. Pain is always a personal experience. Yes, it is a correct answer because pain perception is by individual and each individual is a different patient. Pain and nociception are different. They are not one and the same thing. And pain definitely has adverse effects on functional, social, and psychological well-being. Right. So, uh, but good. Uh, our uh, participants are. I'll clarify that pain and nociception are different in subsequent slides. Okay. Uh, another MCQ. Which of the following, uh, Nishant, can you help me? Yes, sir. Which of the following are included in the main categories of chronic pain by the IASP? Uh, one is chronic primary pain, two is chronic secondary musculoskeletal pain, three chronic neuropathic pain, and four chronic cancer-related pain. So the options are A is one, uh, all one, two, and three, B is one, two, and four, C is two, three, and four, and D, all of them, one, two, three, and four, they are included in the main categories of uh, chronic pain. So we'll give them one minute, sir. Yeah. included in the main categories of chronic pain. Many of them are answering D. So the correct answer is D that uh, uh, chronic primary pain, chronic secondary musculoskeletal pain, chronic neuropathic pain, chronic cancer related pain, they are all one of the types of the seven categories, other being the chronic uh, post-traumatic or post-surgical one, and uh, the musculoskeletal is already there, and uh, cancer related. So they are part of the uh, seven uh, categories. So all of them are included in the main categories of the chronic pain. Okay. But another important question which is called, asked in the uh, examination is briefly enumerate the modalities to assess pain. Until unless we assess the pain properly, we won't be able to treat it properly. Right. So first one is the pain intensity. It can be assessed by a verbal or a numerical or a visual rating scale. And patient should be asked to rate the average pain intensity for the last one week on an 11 point numeric rating scale, which range from zero, that means no pain to 10 worst pain imaginable or a hundred millimeters or 10 centimeter vast scale. And pain should be assessed at rest and movement over the, uh, and we should ask for last one week. And as a verbal rating scale, it can be zero pain to 10 worst pain imaginable. Visual, it can be visual analog scale or faces pain scale. And there are numerous other scales which are there. So this is the uh, visual analog scale, zero, no pain, and 10 means worst pain, possible pain. And this is the uh, long vector spaces pain rating scale from zero to 10. Zero means not, no hurt, and 10 means worst hurt. And it can be mild, moderate, and severe. Mild is NRS one to three, moderate is four to six, and severe is seven to 10. And mild pain uh, gas, less than 31 millimeters, moderate 31 to 54 millimeters, and severe 55 to 100 millimeters. So one, we have assessed the intensity. Second, after intensity, we should assess the pain-related distress by asking the patient to rate the pain-related distress they experienced in the last week. And it is a multifactorial, unpleasant, emotional experience of a cognitive behavior, emotional, social or spiritual nature due to the persistent or recurrent experience of pain. So how it has affected their 
सोशो साइकोलॉजिकल प्रोफाइल ऑन सेम वे ऑन आइदर इलेवन पॉइंट एन आर एस और वेस्टेल एंड यू कैन कैटेगराइज इन टू माइल्ड मॉडरेट एंड स्वीर डिस्ट्रेस इन अ सिमिलर मैनर एज वी डन द इंटेंसिटी then it is a pain related interference how it has affected in last one week on a 11 point uh, nrs or 10 uh, 0 to 100 visual nrs scale into the day to day activities uh, how much disability it has caused and it can be mild moderate in severe according to same nrs or vas and then we should always assess the temporal characteristics of the pain whether the pain is continuous that means the pain is always present continuous with pain attacks that means the pain is present continuously but there are recurrent exacerbations of the pain or it is an episodic recurrent that there are recurrent pain attacks with pain free intervals so continuous pain or continuous pain with pain attacks or intermittent pain attacks with pain free intervals and fifth we have to assess that the patient who is in pain whether there are certain psychosocial factors also like some cognitive emotional behavior or social factors that accompany the chronic pain nishan <clears throat> there's a question again uh, mcq uh, which is incorrect regarding assessment of chronic pain uh, severity of pain b type of pain uh, whether it is associated with physical and psychological factors and d as in the last one day so which is incorrect uh, amongst all these things uh, the listeners are encouraged to again type in the chat box yes sir most of them uh, are mentioning uh, option d there is a there there might be a few a uh, has come so we definitely assess the uh, severity of pain how severe is the pain uh, by the nrs or vas and uh, type of pain uh, whether it is an acute or chronic pain whether it is a cancer or non cancer pain or a nociceptive or neuropathic pain whether it is associated with physical or psychological factors and definitely d is wrong because we average take in the last one week not one day thank you nishan we move forward yeah. so pain assessment includes this uh, whole thing severity which includes the intensity distress and interference type of pain cancer non cancer acute chronic neuropathic nociceptive or primary or secondary are there other factors like physical or psychological factor and temporal character continuous episodic recurrent or continuous with pain attacks another question which comes uh, in theory exam is discuss pain pathway and what is the gate control theory of pain so pain is how we perceive or feel pain and nociception is how pain signals get from the site of injury to the brain so pain is a perception or a feeling and nociception is transmission of signals from the site of injury to the brain and both are not same so there are uh, four steps involved in pain physiology the periphery where the stimulus or nerve injury is happening then spinal cord brain and subsequently modulation so the injury is occurring at the periphery through peripheral nerve it's going to the spinal cord then through the ascending pathways to the brain and then descending the modulation so let's see periphery the tissue injury occurs there occurs the release of chemicals stimulation of pain receptors and signals travel in the peripheral nerve in a delta and c fibers so to the spinal cord in the spinal cord uh, the dorsal horn is the first release stations and the a delta and c nerve synapses with the second order neuron and they travel opposite side of the spinal cord and then they go up Thalamus uh, is the second relay station in the brain, and it con connects to the cortex, limbic system, and the brain stem. And the perception of brain occurs in the brain. And then is the modulation. It involves the uh, descending uh, pathways from brain to the dorsal horn, and usually it inhibits the pain signals, which are negative uh, effect is there. So the signals which are coming from the periphery. 
So we have to focus on the periphery, the ascending pathway, that and then moving to the spinal cord, and then from spinal cord to the brain, and subsequently modulation. The output, we should have, uh, there are numerous theories which are uh, proposed, uh, the gate control theory, intensity theory, specific theory, pattern theory, but the most common one uh, which has been studied and accepted is the gate control theory. And the bottom line is about the large diameter sensory fibers and the small uh, diameter sensory fibers and how they affect the transmission cells. Ronald Melzer and Patrick Ball introduced the gate control theory of pain in 1965. And <clears throat> if the small diameter sensory fibers, the C fibers are open, the open gate means more activity in the small diameter sensory fibers and the pain is felt. And more activity in the large diameter sensory fibers, <clears throat> which are the touch and pressure, uh, then the transmission cells are not firing. Pain is not felt. So both thin, the pain fibers and the large diameter, the touch, pressure and vibration nerve fibers carry the information from the site of injury into the spinal cord. Transmission cells that carry the pain signals up to the brain. And these are the inhibitory interneurons that impede the transmission cell activity. So they will decrease the activity of the transmission cells. The large diameter sensory fibers, they will stimulate these inhibitory interneurons, which will decrease the transmission cell activity, and there will be decreased transmission of impulses to the brain. The small diameter sensory fiber, this inhibition is reduced, and transmission cells are less inhibited, and there is more transmission of impulses to the brain. Activity in both thin and large diameter fibers excites the transmission cells. Thin fiber activity, this is the thin fiber activity, impedes the inhibitory cells. So it is blocking the inhibitory cells, allowing it to the transmission cells to fire and pain is perceived. So it says C fibers, if they are acting more, pain will be felt. And hence the large diameter fibers activity, it tends to uh, inhibit the transmission to the brain. And these are the pressure vibration activity. If they are acting more, less pain is felt. So this is gate control theory of pain, which are these large limited fiber. If they are working more, they tend to decrease the impulses going up to the brain so that less pain is felt. So the NMC says, that in the first year, there should be introduction to acute and chronic pain and pain management, which we have been discussing so far. Second year, they should be talking about care of terminally ill. And in third year, you should be talk about chronic pain therapy and therapeutic nerve blocks under supervision and then independently and briefly orient you to the non-conventional methods of treatment. And the resident should be posted for one month in pain clinic during six months to 24 months of MD tenure. And our resident should demonstrate the following abilities, assessment of patients with pain, including history taking. And I can tell you that you should be a very patient listener. Listen to the patient. Once you listen to the patient, he will tell you majority of the things. And then subsequent, based on a strong examination, you can come to the diagnosis followed by relevant investigations. And then you can be very, very sure what is the cause of the pain, what is the source of the pain, from where the pain is coming. There are certain terms which are used very commonly in pain clinics, allodynia. It is a term used to describe pain that occurs from a stimulus that doesn't usually cause pain, like barely touching your skin. So this is allodynia. A simple touch suggestion or simple stimulus, which normally does not cause pain, if it causes pain, it is allodynia. Hyperalgesia. It is an abnormally increased sensitivity to pain, which may be caused by damage to nociceptors, peripherals or peripheral nerves, and there can be hypersensitivity to the stimulus. So hyperalgesia is, yes, with the stimulus, pain will occur. But in hyperalgesia, there is an abnormally increased sensitivity to the pain. Hyperpathia. 
is a term to describe an excessive response to a pain trigger and pain continues after the pain trigger is gone so once uh, stimulus is there there is an excessive response and this response persists even if the stimulus is gone biofeedback it is a complementary medicine technique that trains you to control your body's unconscious process like breathing heart rate which can help to alleviate pain in some way or the other dysesthesia is a sensation that people typically describe as painful itching burning or restrictive paresthesia is abnormal sensation of the skin uh, like tingling pricking chilling with no apparent physical cause and breakthrough pain is pain that occurs suddenly uh, you were pain free you were on medications but suddenly pain has occurred either on its own or because of a result of a particular activity so that is a breakthrough pain nishan yes sir so uh, you mentioned this many time what is the what is correct for allodynia a an abnormally increased uh, sensitivity to pain b an abnormal sensation of the skin like pricking c pain that occurs suddenly or as a result of a particular activity or d pain that occurs from a stimulus that doesn't usually cause pain so uh, i believe this should not be a very difficult one sir people there are we are getting answers in the chat box yeah so all the various terms that you described allodynia paresthesia these are all commonly asked also most of uh, them have mentioned uh, the answer d d so uh, yeah. that, that's mm. uh, correct that the pain that occurs from a stimulus that does not usually cause this pain is allodynia pain that occurs suddenly or as a result of particular activity is breakthrough pain a normal sensation of the skin is uh, paresthesia and abnormally increased sensitivity to pain is hyperalgesia okay thank you nishan Yes, so our uh, postgraduates must demonstrate, in addition to history, assessment of pain, including physical examination, and that is very very important. Uh, from where the pain is coming, so we should be very very perfect in doing. Suppose a patient is of PIVD, uh, we should be able to demonstrate how much is the straight leg raise test. Obviously, patient is lying comfortably on the bed in supine position, the opposite limb is flexed, and then you gently. the whole weight is on your hand and you raise the leg and do the flex dorsal flex the foot and then see at what degree the pain is coming and whether there is radiation from uh, uh, back to the foot and also the mapping has to be done whether the pain is there in the l5 division l4 l5 division l3 division we have to do this mapping and we should be very very perfect and even in the beginning even you have the neuronal map the photograph of that on your table that also is not bad so that you can remember pain is coming from uh, l3 division or l4 division or l5 division and uh, that this is quite useful you should be good suppose patient is having sacro leg joint uh, arthralgia and he gives typically that uh, on prolonged sitting i am having pain or when i am squatting i am having pain so you should be able to demonstrate fabers test uh, flexion abduction and external rotation and uh, that will or compression of the bilateral si joints so you will be able to know yes pain is coming from the si joint slr negative pain only on the back only on extension or lateral rotation that means facet joints are of involved of the lumbar region neck facet joint you just compress on the head and press it there and pain mimics that means facet joints are involved uh, there may be trigger points uh, in myofascial pain syndromes you have to palpate the upper back or the lumbar region inch by inch to see whether the pain is coming from uh, this particular uh, group of muscles so physical examination in addition to history taking is very very essential in localizing the source of pain and we should also uh, be able to interpret, interpret investigations we have been examining x ray chest and x ray cervical spine lateral view for airway assessment but in pain clinics you have to uh, 
see for majority of the x rays which are coming are of uh, knee back and neck and shoulder joint and hip joint and pelvis so this is a typical uh, patients coming for osteoarthritis knee calgren lorenz radiographic uh, criteria in grade 1 there is doubtful narrowing of the joint space and uh, some osteophytic uh, lipping grade 2 definite uh, there are osteophytes are present and some narrowing is there grade 3 uh, multi moderate multiple osteophytes are there and narrowing of the joint typically the medial compartment is more affected and grade 4 or there are large osteophytes and marked narrowing of the joint space and there is severe sclerosis also and definitely of bone uh, uh, deformity of the bone contour so you can go from grade 1 to grade 4 of uh, osteoarthritis this is uh, calgren lorenz uh, classification so this is the grade 3 1 uh, where you can see that there is definitive narrowing of the uh, joint space and this is uh, grade 4 total narrowing multiple osteophytes and deformity of the bone contour is there similarly uh, for cervical spine Uh, we look forward uh, from moving from this airway uh, we have to go slightly back because our focus earlier was here only so you have to see uh, uh, the disc space is narrowing this is the second vertebra 3 4 5 5 so c5 c6 narrowing is there there are osteophytes at c5 c6 and some at c4 these are the bony spurs so this is typically seen in patients with cervical spondylitis and then uh, x ray of the uh, lumbar spine Uh, and this is the normal one the normal vertebrae with no narrowing uh, this is uh, mild disc space where slight narrowing is there and some osteophytes can be seen and this is the c there is there is a marked narrowing of the uh, disc space and disc narrowing is there so this is l5 s1 so this can be uh, these are very very commonly seen in pain clinics so we have to learn uh, interpretation of these x rays also and also of the mri also and something about uh, the t1 weighted image t1 uh, images are uh, basically uh, to see the uh, fat uh, the tissue type is which is bright is fat so uh, this is the bone marrow of the vertebral bodies so this is the white portion this is the subcutaneous fat this is white in portion this is the epidural fat so you can see these are all white so t1 uh, the white is fat so this is csf csf so this is black in color so uh, as you can see here this is the csf so this is the csf which is black in color because it does not have any fat it is a fluid so this is the t1 weighted image where the tissue which is available bright is fat in t2 uh, both uh, the tissues which are white are fat and water so as earlier seen the bone marrow uh, this will be white the subcutaneous tissue will be white right and uh, the epidural fat will be white but in t2 the csf now which was earlier black is now white so because this is containing uh, water so this is a t2 weighted image so in t1 only fat is white and in t2 the fat and water is white so this that's why we can compare between the t1 and t2 images that if some some but something is white in t2 and black in t1 that is a, a fluid like csf and this is uh, commonly seen in uh, uh, pain clinics the mri of the lumbar spine and just shown uh, subgroup 1 it is the you can see that there is a lumbar disc herniation uh, at two levels more at l4 l5 level and uh, there is indentation of the fecal sac and then uh, here uh, you can see that there is Uh, because of the thickening of the ligamentum flavum there is narrowing uh, of the foramina so this is a case of a lumbar canal stenosis and here you can see that the there is lysthesis uh, this one so there is a migration or subluxation of the l5 vertebral body as compared to the s1 so l5 s1 lysthesis so this can be seen on x ray also but yes you can always always categorize uh, or list for this disc herniation or indentation uh, mri is essential so there can be bulging disc because with age uh, intraoperative disc may lose fluid and become dried out and subsequently there can be breakthrough of the tough outer ring the annulus 
which lets the nucleus uh, to bulge out. And uh, that is the bulging disc. And rupture, if it, it, it can herniate also, it can fully rupture also. So then the inner, inner nucleus pulposum of the disc uh, ruptures out from the annulus. And these are the fragments of the disc material can press on the nerve roots, uh, which are just located behind the disc space, leading on to pain and uh, radicular component of pain in the back and the lower limb. So we as pain physicians uh, have to be very good as a doctor also. We have to observe and uh, how the patient is coming and uh, what he is telling. We have to record, we have to tabulate, we have to communicate record what he is telling and we have tabulate with the previous digits also and communicate him everything and listen to him also very, very properly. We should have good uh, communication skills. We should use all our five senses, maybe sixth sense also. We have to be transparent, informative to him, honest, confident and caring. We have to listen to him and we have to be competent in knowledge, social and communication skills and definitely show respect to the patient who is saying that I am suffering from pain. So if you want to be successful, you have to be willing to disappear for a while to acquire if something is lacking in any of these. The good doctor uh, treats the disease and the great doctor treats the patient who has the disease. So we don't have to treat the pain, but we have to treat the patient who is in pain. Our curriculum says that uh, MD anesthesiology postgraduate must possess and demonstrate abilities to manage chronic pain and different modalities of chronic pain management, whether it is pharmacotherapy, non opioid anesthesia, intervention neuroblockage, advanced uh, intervention therapies, and cognitive and uh, psychotherapy. So we have to teach multimodal approach to the pain management involving uh, pharmacotherapy, interventions, psychological support, good physiotherapy, and some role of complementary and alternative medicine. I'll briefly talk about some drugs which are commonly used in pain clinics. Uh, gabapentin, the GABA analog, the anti drug is very, very commonly used, gabapentin and pregabalin, and in combination either with methylcobalamin or nortriptyline, methylcobalamin 500 mics, or nortriptyline 10 milligrams, and you can it is available in different preparations, 100, 200, 300, 450, and 600 SR, usually started with 300 milligrams uh, HS, and we can increase every three to seven days as tolerated. It is a very good safe margin, up to 2.4 grams can be easily used, but in our setup, usually we require somewhere around maximum of 900 milligrams. It is useful in neuropathic component of pain, the diaptic neuropathy, post arpitic neuralgia, CRPS, phantom limb pain, post-stroke pain, as an adjunct therapy in lumbar radiculopathy, and it definitely improves the analytic efficacy of opioids in cancer pain. The common side effects of dizziness, sedation, lightheadedness, somnolence, and that is why it is given at bedtime and treated it gradually, nausea, vomiting, constipation, and weight gain. Regablin uh, is then uh, binds to the alpha to delta subunit of voltage gated, uh, gated calcium channels, and Dose is 75 milligrams. Again, it comes in combination with pregabalin and methylcobalamin. Uh, pregabalin low dose semi is there with 50 milligrams. And you can gradually increase it every three to seven days by 75 milligrams. And maximum, you can go up to 600 milligrams. Even our patient population tolerates somewhere between 225 to 300 milligram uh, in a day. Uh, it is a drug of choice for diaptic neuropathy and post herpetic neuralgia. Uh, some studies have shown the rapid onset of pain relief than gabapentin and there are uh, decrease, decreased dose related side effects and faster titration is possible, though it can also have side effects like dizziness and somnolence, weight gain, peripheral edema, fluid and water retention, especially we have to be careful in patients who are taking uh, diuretics, old age people with congestive heart failure, we have to be cautious in them. It can have offer uh, lead on to blood vision, ataxia. So fall should not be there, especially in old people. So we have to be cautious about these side effects. Dry mouth and headache are the initial symptoms. Amitriptyline, a tricyclic antidepressant, uh, serotonin and uh, noradrenaline reuptake inhibitor. And 
we start uh, with the 10 to 25 milligrams never required more than 75 milligrams in a day and uh, it is quite useful as an adjunct along with gabapentin and pregabalin especially in patients with diabetic neuropathy post stroke pain radicular component of pain and it has got uh, neuropathic properties at lower doses and antidepressant effect is at higher doses and uh, side effects are definitely dry mouth uh, if patient is of uh, benign prostate hypertrophy don't give that patient amitriptyline in the night because he will have dry mouth he will take more water again he will have to go to the washroom and he won't be able to sleep duloxetine is another uh, non uh, tricyclic serotonin and non epinephrine reuptake inhibitor and uh, commonly used dose is 30 mg and you can go as i as 120 mg in a day it is also used in diabetic neuropathy fibromyalgia and uh, also takes care of the depression and anxiety component and treatment of choice in neuropathic pain with psychiatric comorbidities and definitely side effects are there nausea sedation dry mouth urinary retention and sexual dysfunction Remodol is the most commonly used analgesic in pain clinics because we have to uh, advise uh, for a longer period of time. It can be uh, the 15 milligrams, 100 milligram SR, or 37.5 milligrams with paracetamol, 325 milligrams, the common one used. And uh, uh, it is a weak mu receptor agonist and also inhibits serotonin and norepinephrine reuptake. Doses as high as 400 milligrams per day can be given, but it is a very very commonly used drug. because of its safety and efficacy definitely nausea and vomiting uh, are the most common side effects always combined with pantoprazole dsr uh, so that patient does not have uh, nausea and vomiting uh, it acts by analgesia by multiple pathways as i have told you there is a decreased risk of ventilatory depression uh, no risk of tolerance and dependence and uh, definitely uh, the most common side effect is uh, nausea and vomiting and we have to Take care in patients uh, who are having severe renal dysfunction. Doricoxib commonly used in patients with uh, osteoarthritis of knee and osteoarthritis of hip joint. It is a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug which selectively inhibits COX-2 uh, receptors, and dose is uh, usually uh, 90 milligrams uh, OD. Commonly given at night time because morning pain is more in uh, in some conditions, and commonly combined with paracetamol. it is uh, decreased has got decreased risk of gi ulceration and decreased risk of platelet aggregation and definitely you have to decrease the dose in patients with hepatic dysfunction rather not to give is better thing baclofenac used only selectively for few days not more than 2 weeks if patient is in severe pain 15 mg tds going up to as i as 75 mg tds maximum dose is uh, 200 mg and uh, definitely gastritis and uh, uh, nephrotoxicity are common side effects if patients are old we don't want to take some chances so we never give it for more than 2 uh, weeks in pain clinics estaminophen commonly combined with numerous drugs whether it is tramadol whether it is doricoxib whether it is baclofenac or acetophenac uh, a very safe drug you can go as high as up to uh, 3.75 grams in uh, a day and numerous patients are available 500 mg 650 mg or 1 gram a very safe drug uh, first line of therapy in geriatric pain we should not think that this is a drug for fever it is a drug very good drug for a uh, pain management also and definitely we have to take care of hepatotoxicity and if liver dysfunctions are deranged or patient is old age we can reduce the drug to by 50% clozapine is a commonly used uh, agent combined with uh, diclofenac and uh, doricoxib or for part of its uh, muscle relaxant and uh, usually 500 mg is there a big tablet in combination and you can go as high as tds it is a central acting uh, agent and uh, the moderate efficacy in acute musculoskeletal pain back pain uh, ls pain and uh, definitely it can also cause significant drowsiness dizziness and malaise uh, some amount of liver dysfunction hycolcyside is uh, another uh, muscle relaxant which is commonly used it is a gaba a and glycine receptor antagonist and uh, dose is 4 to 8 mg 
uh, usually even as BD dose. Uh, it can uh, lead on to most common side effect is diarrhea, which is seen, and some uh, reproductive disorders uh, can be there. It can decrease the threshold also. So you have to be cautious when using these drugs for a longer period of time. Ethanidine is also uh, used as a muscle in two to four milligrams. It is a alpha two agonist with fewer cardiovascular side effects than uh, clonidine or dexmedetomine. Carbamazepine is a tricyclic anti-epileptic drug, very commonly used for trigeminal neuralgia and phantom pain. It blocks sodium channels and it inhibits high-frequency repetitive firing in neurons. And you can start as low as from 100 milligram uh, BD or TDS and go up to type it gradually up to 1200 milligram. A commonly used drug for trigeminal neuralgia and phantom pain. It is the drug of choice of trigeminal neuralgia, as I have told you. There is decreased severity of pain and pain episodes. Other indications are post stroke pain, post arthritic neuralgia, and diabetic neuropathy. Uh, side effects are diplopia, sedation, nausea, and uh, you have to take care of the hematological disturbances as a granulocytosis or a plastic anemia is common. So, blood counts are done every three months. Oxcarbamazepine is similar to uh, carbamazepine. It also blocks the sodium channels, and dose is 300 mg BD, and you can go up to uh, as high as 1500 milligrams. Better safety profile than uh, carbamazepine, and uh, definitely there is risk of hyponatremia and syndrome of inappropriate secretion of the diuretic hormone. So, coming from pharmacotherapy, uh, our students also must have principles of management of the nociceptive pain, the interventions, and it has been said that in third year, they should be able to perform interventions under supervision or maybe uh, with assistance. So they should be performed under observer. Uh, first, they should be observing it, then performing uh, under supervision and uh, maybe assisting it uh, in the beginning and then performing under supervision. So myofascial pain syndromes, very, very commonly seen. And the trigger point is the pain generator. Once you press it on the trigger point, patient will say, yes, this is either, this is some or all of my pain. And these trigger points, they may present on upper back, lower back. And once the patient has undergone the treatment modality is application, ultrasonic massage, sweeping, stretching, trigger point injections are the cornerstone. You do it with 25 gauge fine needle, with uh, bupivacaine rinsed with slight amount of steroid, uh, 10 to 20 milligrams of dexamethasone uh, or uh, triamcelone or uh, 2 milligrams of dexamethasone under uh, slight pressure in a fanning technique. So you do it in a fanning technique, hold it between your thumb and uh, finger, direct go perpendicular, then lateral and medial. So you inject in a fan shaped manner. Needle does not come out, it stays there. So trigger point injections can be done in the upper back, paraspinal muscles of the neck, uh, upper lower part of the upper back, or in the lumbar regions. They have to be repeated uh, at least twice a week or maybe more, and six to seven sittings are required. Fibromyalgia, it's absolutely different from myofascial pain syndrome. It is syndrome characterized by widespread pain in muscles, ligaments, bursa, tendons, and it has got multiple tender points. So. Myofascial pain syndrome is characterized by trigger points and fibromyalgia is characterized by tender points. And this pain is for more than three months with obviously no specific cause of pain. And patients feel pain in response to a slight pressure that is around four kg per square centimeter. Tender points may be present in muscle, muscle tendon junction, junction, bursa or fat pad, deep soft tissues outside the joint capsule or periosteum and they are definitely the characteristics of fibromyalgia. This is the old diagram of the fibromyalgia tender points, just to show you that where the tender points can be present, the occiput or the anterior aspect uh, of the uh, back on the uh, trapezius or anterior aspects in the lower cervical region, the costochondral junction, the gluteal uh, region, the supraspinatus region, the greater trochanter, knee, elbow. So these are the points uh, where you can just, if you press and apply a pressure, the gentle pressure will lead on to allodynia. That means which should not cause pain. The pain will be 
there. And definitely, fibromyalgia is associated with poor sleep, headache, and uh, bowel disturbances. And typically, the symptoms wax and wane. There are good months, there are bad months, there are good weeks, there are bad weeks. And usual complaint is that the it is more common in young females. And the husband will say that this is a attention seeking behavior of the wife. And mother in law will say that the wife does not, the daughter in law doesn't want to work. But these are the true sufferers. Fibromyalgia is an entity which needs diagnosis and treatment. And treatment is uh, either with uh, anti inflammatory drugs like alpantin, mepigabin, combined either with amitriptyline or duloxetine, and NSAIDs and tramadol. And definitely, there is a good role of uh, patient self-management, including uh, cognitive behavior therapy and support groups. We have got in our pain clinic fibromyalgia support group. We have different model, uh, patients suffering from fibromyalgia. They sit together and discuss how they uh, do their day-to-day -day activities without any support of the medications. Nishant. Yes, sir. So the question is, whether uh, trigger point injections are indicated in A, myofascial pain syndromes, B, fibromyalgia, C, both A and B, and D, none of the two, none of the above. So trigger point injections are indicated uh, in which of the following, myofascial pain syndromes, fibromyalgia, both A and B, and none of the above. We'll give them, sir, uh, one minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 45 minutes, uh, 45 seconds. More. You have shown how to give the trigger point injections. I think I will have to. Uh... So, uh, majority have answered C, which is not a correct answer. Uh, correct answer is A, the trigger point injections are indicated in myofascial pain syndromes. And as I've told you, trigger point injections are characteristics of myofascial pain syndromes and tender points are characteristics of fibromyalgia. And in fibromyalgia, uh, trigger point injections uh, are indicated only for, primarily for myofascial pain syndromes. They don't have much role in fibromyalgia. Okay, so we move forward to the uh, back pain, which is another very, very common subset of the patients. Majority of the patients which are coming to pain clinics are musculoskeletal pain. And majority of the patients with musculoskeletal pain are patients with uh, back pain. And pain can come in back from disc. It can come from uh, facet joint. It can come from back muscles also. It can come from SI joint. Uh, if we go lower, it can come from... Uh, Preformis muscle or it can come from coccyx. So we have to see from where the pain is coming and thorough history and clinical examination, as I've discussed earlier, is very, very essential to rule out from where the pain is coming. And MRI is commonly done before performing any intervention because caries spine is not uncommon in our country. The initial treatment definitely comprises of analgesics, neuromodulators, motor relaxants, physiotherapy and precautions. Typically, a patient who comes with low back pain, the treatment is not same for all because we have to see that how the patient is uh, uh, behaving and what are his expectations. A 60 years old female will have got a different uh, expectations and a person who is working, who cannot have more than 10 days of leave, will have definitely different expectations. And a person who has to go back and join his duty will have different expectations. So we will ha we have to tailor the treatment. We cannot say that we will give conservative therapy for six weeks in all patients, or we will do intervention within two weeks in all patients. No, we have to see the expectations of the patients and then decide what are the modalities which have to be given. Definitely, initially, we go for a combination of uh, non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs or tramadol along with muscle relaxants as a tricolchicide or uh, chlorzexon, gabapentin or trigabin, and ask them not to bend forward, not to lift heavy weight, 
and not to sit on the floor and in, in go for uh, some uh, physical therapy techniques like ultrasonic massage or short wave diathermy with no manipulations with no uh, traction and get an x-ray uh, lumbar spine done if it is involving the lumbar which is the most common one and then subsequently you go for uh, mri before performing any intervention so the drugs which are commonly used are gabapentin and pregabalin uh, in combination with uh, not recommended so nmc says that we our resident should practice epidural steroid injections at all levels and should also be well versed with long term epidural catheterization and have knowledge of fluoroscope and usg anatomical imaging so because uh, you should block can be given by fluoroscope or usg so the most common block which is performed uh, is a selective nerve root block with patient in a uh, prone position and you see that suppose it is uh, suppose it is a right side l4 uh, nerve which is affected affected so you put a drug through a transdermal route and see the anterior epidural spread of the drug in the selective nerve root blocks uh, less amount of drug is required and you are injecting at the site of the pathology so these are the pictures of selective or transdermal nerve root blocks a common question which comes is uh, in the evaluation of back pain uh, what what are the different uh, causes of uh, back pain and uh, then you have to tell them that the common causes of back pain are the herniated disc facet joint si joint coccyx uh, muscle groups what are the investigations which are required so you have to talk about x ray and mri what are the drugs you have to uh, prescribe the examination about the straight leg raised and fibers test and the pharmacotherapy the complementary medicine the precautions and then the interventions the interventions are what are the routes of giving epidural steroid injections uh, what are the sites of giving epidural steroid, uh, steroid injections the definitely it can be cervical thoracic or lumbar uh, or uh, caudal any route can be given and the uh, it can be either a transforaminal one or a interlaminar one or a parasagittal one so we'll discuss each and one whether it can be done by image guidance nowadays nothing is done with anatomical landmarks guided technique everything is done either fluoroscopic guided which is a gold standard or by a usg guided so uh, the first one which was the transformal one now the caudal epidural one it is done with also done in patient in prone position and uh, you can see the needle going into the epidural space and you can see the dye which is the omnipec dye which is used and you can see the typical christmas tree appearance and this is good for bilateral l5s1 or even l4 l5 l5s1 uh, through the so you are putting the drug through the lower root the caudal root it can be done by usg also and initially you place the probe uh, transversely at the midline at the sacral hiatus and uh, these are the structure the sacral cornu which is the inverted reverse u shaped appearance the sacrococcygeal ligament and the sacral hiatus then you put the needle into the epidural space and then you put the uh, color pattern and see the mosaic which is coming up so this is uh, this is you are sure that the drug is into the epidural space but you are not sure with usg whether the drug is reaching up to the affected compartment that is the l4 or l5 that can be seen only by the uh, fluoroscope guided injection then you can do a midline interlaminar which we commonly use do in uh, by the anatomical landmark guided technique but in the pain patients we do it under fluoroscope guided and you can do it in the prone commonly done in prone or lateral position sometimes done in sitting position and the parasagittal epidural block we go at the far lateral end suppose there is involvement of right side l3 l4 l5 so you put the parasagittal epidural block and see that the drug is reaching the anterior compartment so the floor anatomy Uh, initially i can understand that the pgs have to understand that this is the vertebral body this is the intervertebral disc space and you are uh, there is the anterior epidural spread uh, of the drug this is the posterior epidural spread this you gradually learn so no need to get disheartened the floral anatomy gradually you will learn about it uh, you have to you can perform at the uh, cervical epidural also commonly done with the cervical disc with the cervical uh, radicular component of pain affecting the bilateral upper limb in this uh, usually done in sitting position or prone position if it is a difficult uh, pain score is very high 
you can leave the catheter in, in situ also. And herein you use only normal saline, usually done at uh, C67 or C7T1 and uh, 4 ml of drug comprising of uh, 2 ml of dexamethasone and uh, 2 ml of normal saline is used. We don't use local anesthetic uh, so that to be on a safer side. And if catheter is left in situ, you can give the drug again on day two and day three and then take out the catheter. And uh, our residents, we should teach them about the epidural additional lysis also in post back surgery syndrome, uh, which can be done by Rex catheter also or by a simple PVC catheter also. The advantage of using PVC catheter is that there is less risk of doing a dural puncture. And you do it with normal saline and hyaluronidase, 10 ml of normal saline with 15,000 units of hyaluronidase. And you see under fluoroscopic guidance, this is a patient who has undergone uh, surgery. Now pain has reoccurred. And suppose pain is at this compartment, but drug is reaching care only. So because of surgery, there are adhesions. So you have to do additional lysis and so that ensure that your drug reaches up to the affected compartment. So first you do the additional lysis and then ensure that the drug has reached the, uh, this dye you can see has reached the affected compartment. Facet joint uh, is a facet syndrome is a pain on extension and lateral rotation as I've told you. It is a primarily a diagnosis, uh, clinical diagnosis and either you can do a facet joint injection or a medial branch block at the same level and one level above it you can do a diagnostic block followed by a radiofrequency denervation. So this is a typical uh, facet joint injection. The, you can see these are the facet joints. Uh, squatty dog appearance is there. And you inject into the lower aspect of this squatty dog. And you can, uh, these are the facet joint injections. And 0.5 to 1 ml drug is required. And uh, you can go for a medial branch block also. So at usually done for a one nerve at two levels. And uh, first you do a diagnostic block and then subsequently you can do a radiofrequency lesioning and uh, that can be lead on to pain relief for at least six months to one year. Moving further down, hip joint. We all know that THR is a definitive procedure, but some patients are not affording, some are not willing. And initial treatment is conservative, paracetamol, etoric oxide and gel. But if it is affecting the quality of life, you have to offer them pain relief and treatment is intraarticular injection of hip joint, either with local anesthetic and corticosteroid or platelet-rich plasma. It's done under uh, fluoroscopic guidance, anterior approach. Uh, you are one centimeter uh, below the inguinal ligament and lateral to the femoral artery. And you are away from the uh, uh, joint capsule. And this is typically known as hello sign or the necklace sign. So needle is uh, very far. And this is uh, the capsule. And this is just like female's necklace, only anterior aspect is seen, posterior aspect is not seen. So hello or necklace sign of the dye comes. And then you can inject your drug. Moving further down, coccyx, very common uh, pain syndrome in old age or in young females who are working, either old age because of fall in washroom and in females because of fall on stairs. 80 to, 80 to 90 percent is managed conservatively with paracetamol or etoric oxide with anti-inflammatory drugs, primary coat and uh, hot fermentation and gel and ring application. If it is not responding to that, you go for uh, ganglion power block. Uh, as discussed last time, it is the uh, lowermost uh, sympathetic ganglion, uh, which is lying just anterior to the sacrococcygeal junction. And you can go either by a sacrococcygeal approach or an intercoccygeal approach by a spinal needle uh, between the sacrum and coccyx. So this is between the uh, sacrum and coccyx. And this is between the intercoxial segment. This is sacrococcygeal approach, sacrum coccyx, and this is the intercoxial approach between the first and second coccygeal joint. And then you put a dye, and you are far away from the rectum. This is the uh, rectum shadow which is seen, and this is the spread of the drug. Patients with who are of non-malignant vision, we go for local anesthetic and uh, corticosteroid injection, and uh, subsequently we can go for radiofrequency uh, denervation also. Commonly done under UAG guide, uh, fluoroscope guidance, but sometimes done under UAG guidance also. And for uh, malignancy, we we'll go for a, a phenol or alcohol injection, 6% phenol, 4 to 6 ml is usually injected. So these are the pictures of the ganglion impar block. And for CA rectum and CA perineum, we go for a, a neurolytic ganglion impar block. And uh, RF uh, is also commonly done. Uh, in these patients who are of 
uh, both non malignant and malignant tumor. This is RF of uh, gene path. Moving further down, buttocks. Pain comes come from uh, piriformis muscle. Typically, pain is there in patients who are prolonged uh, sitting. This is the extra sacrolar joint, one centimeter below and one centimeter lateral. You put the needle, and this is the, you can see one centimeter below and one centimeter lateral to the lower end of the SI joint. And then you see the spread of the muscle below the piriformis muscle. It is diagnostic also and therapeutic also because it is also a clinical diagnosis. Very difficult to locate by MRI whether the sciatic nerve is being compressed below the piriformis muscle. So this is the pictures of the piriformis syndrome. Sacroiliac joint. It is the uh, largest diarthroidal joint of the body between the sacrum and the ilium. And the common cause of pain of sacroiliac joint is osteoarthritis. But definitely we have to rule out caries and malignancy. Initial treatment is conservative with anti-inflammatory drugs, precautions. And uh, subsequently we go for SI joint injection either under fluoroscope guidance or under UHG guidance. With fluoroscope guidance, usually we do it under lower uh, one third of the SI joint and then see the spread of the drug all over the SI joint. So you can do it under <coughs> fluoroscope guidance or under the UHG guidance also. Knee joint, very, very common uh, patients uh, profile in pain clinics, doctors, relatives of doctors, uh, uh, common uh, public also. And it is very, very common in age more than 60 years. And there can be associated synovitis, effusions, and meniscal abnormalities also. We always go for x-ray uh, knee, standing, weight bearing view, and classify it according to the Kellington Lawrence classification. And uh, you can see the joint space narrowing, osteophytes, sclerosis, loose bodies. Always, always rule out that there is no hypothyroidism and blood sugar levels are under control. And uh, Initial treatment, usually the patients have exhausted when they come to us, the paracetamol, NSAIDs, etoric oxibs, tramadol, the visco supplementation drugs like glucosamine and diacerin. Subsequently, we have to go for uh, different modalities available are intraortical injections of local anesthetic and corticosteroids, high molecular weight hyaluronic acid visco supplementation, PRP, and they have been all shown to improve pain and function in osteoarthritis. Platelet rich plasma is commonly used as an intraarticular injection of a knee joint. Uh, it is also used for shoulder joint, equitendinous, and uh, plantar fasciitis. It is an autologous concentration of human platelets in a small volume of plasma where the platelet concentration is four to six times higher than the normal platelet concentration. And usually, normal concentration we know is 1.5 to 2.5 uh, lakhs. It is around uh, 1 million. And platelet direct growth factors. They are stored in alpha granules of platelets and they regulate the biological process of tissue repair. And it has the potential to have a regenerative effect on the body tissues. So uh, the growth factors that can stimulate cell cellular growth are uh, transforming growth factor beta, uh, basic fibroblast growth factor, platelet drive growth factor, epidermal growth factor, vascular endothelial growth factor, and connective tissue growth factor. So this is uh, the PRP machine. And uh, it can stimulate the formation of new cartilage. It can slow down the progression of the disease by reducing inflammation. It can produce more proteins to reduce the sensation of pain. And it can ease the friction. So it has got multiple effects. It has got a regenerative effect. It, it, it slows down the degradation. It corrects the regradation. And it improves the function. And by regeneration. So multi-pronged effect is there of platelet rich plasma. And we can inject it at knee joint, shoulder joint, hip joint, elbows, feet, uh, degenerated intervertebral disc, and in diaptic ulcers. Different phases are there. Uh, 20 ml usually blood is collected. Pre cool before procedure to 22 degrees. The first one is for platelet separation, and second is for platelet concentration. So, this is how uh, the, there are kits also available. You can do it with your indigenous test tubes only, done under sterile conditions. And this is the PIP injection of the knee joint. We do it commonly under fluoroscope guidance and so see that it spreads under all the three compartments of the knee joint, the middle, med medial and the lateral. Yes, intraarticular injection of uh, uh, local anesthetic and corticosteroid is another common thing. 0.25% of opivacaine with 40 mg of triamcinolone is used and uh, not more than three times in a year. Medial mid patellar approach is commonly used uh, in the anatomical slant bar guided Technique. So this is the 
medial mid patellar approach but suppose such bulky knees are there or swollen knees are there then it is always better to do it under flow scope guidance and so that you know that the drug is reaching the affected compartment or suppose the space is very limited then also you are very sure that the drug has gone into the affected compartment and post tkr also uh, knee replacement also pain can be there either because of bursitis so intraarticular injection knee is helpful you can do it under uhg guidance also this is the patella this is the femur and this is the hoffman pad so you inject here when you inject here the hoffman pad goes up so this goes up in this you can inject either uh, local anesthetic corticosteroid prp or uh, high molecular weight uh, hyaluronic acid the visco supplementation it can be done also in addition to the intraarticular injection of the knee joint you can go for a genicular nerve block uh, usually it is done at three points the inferior medial superior medial and superior lateral so it can it is can be done under uhg guidance also and it can be done under fluoroscope guidance also so three points in injection are given and uh, you can initially you do a diagnostic one local anesthetic and corticosteroid inferior medial superior medial and superior lateral and then subsequently you can go for radio frequency ablation of the genicular nerve blocks and we have been doing genicular nerve block post tkr also patients say that now even our tkr has been done still pain is persisting so uh, we have done uh, in uh, 25 to 30 patients and they lead on to reduction in pain score by around 30% so this is genicular nerve post in post tkr patients nishant i'll have a cup glass of water yes sir so the question is all our interventions for osteoarthritis knee except a intraarticular injection of a local anesthetic with steroid b intraarticular injection of prp c genicular nerve block or d epidural injection of local anesthetic with steroid so what uh, we encourage all the answers in the chat box interventions for osteoarthritis knee are all except sir is taking we will be waiting for another half uh, 30 seconds more and uh, for this osteoarthritis knee i think most of you know that d sir so most of the our uh, uh, listeners have uh, answered uh, the correct that the most common uh, all are uh, given for any except for epidural injection which is done for uh, back pain or the uh, herniated disc right thank you uh as we were talking about radio frequency lesioning it is common modality used either pulsed or conventional in patients with facet joints split ganglion lumbar thrombectomy trigeminal neurectomy genicular nerve block or superior hypogastric plexus block so a question can also come discuss the principles of radio frequency lesioning and its application so application can be there in facet joints split ganglion lumbar thrombectomy trigeminal neurectomy genicular nerve block and superior hypogastric Let's just block. I'll come to uh, RF lesioning subsequently. Feet, uh, you can uh, plantar fasciitis and uh, sacral tendonitis are commonly there, and we usually go by anatomical landmark guided technique and usually inject PRP there. But they can be done under fluoroscopic guidance also. Moving up from we have just covered back, buttocks, knee, feet. Moving up, shoulder and neck, uh, shoulder. pain can come from joints muscle groups or bursa and uh, uh, it can be associated with the uh, weakness limited motion of arm and hand there can be difficulty in uh, uh, dressing uh, difficulty in performing day to day work and there can be interrupted uh, sleep also they can be associated with the uh, uh, diabetes most common one which is associated with endocrinology disorder 
and if there is global restriction of active and passive movements uh, it, it is labeled as frozen shoulder and there may occur some uh, secondary sympathetic dystrophy also which is the uh, shoulder hand syndrome in which there is a frozen shoulder with painful swollen cold dystrophic looking hand usually frozen shoulder is the most common entity which is seen in uh, patients who are coming with shoulder pain <clears throat> and the treatment initially is NSAIDs physical therapy <clears throat> and then subsequently you go for PRP injections or corticosteroid injections. So PRP injection is uh, commonly done. Uh, pain physicians usually do it by anterior approach, but some do it by posterior approach also. And around 4 ml of PRP injection is injected. You can go, go an intraarticular injection of the local anesthetic and corticosteroid also. And the landmarks are same that you go between the head of the humerus and the glenoid post of the scapula, one inch below the midpoint of the acromion and inject the drug there. And suprascapular nerve block is also quite useful in patients uh, with uh, uh, cervical radiculopathy with superimposed periarthritis of shoulder and radicular component of pain going to into the upper limb, uh, commonly affected nerve root C5 to C6. And it can be done either by anatomical landmark guided technique in, as an OPD procedure, or you can go by a USG guided approach also, which is where you are very sure that you are going to the skin subcutaneous tissue, trapezius, supraspinatus muscle below the transfer scapular ligament uh, in, into the suprascapular notch. And uh, you can <coughs> inject the drug there under the under vision. From shoulder joint, pain may come from PM joint, which patients are usually referred from the dental OPD. The temporomandibular disorder is a collective term for clinical problems that involve the masticatory musculature, PM joint, or both. And OPD procedure of giving once conservative treatment fails, usually one or two sittings at two weeks interval at the junction of mandibular condyle and glenoid fossa of the zygoma, and you inject around 2 ml of solution. Uh, pain is relieved in a good, uh, along with combination of anti inflammatories and hot, moist fermentation. Neuropathic pain, moving from nociceptive pain to neuropathic pain. Uh, and uh, our residents must be talked about trigeminal neuralgia, post neuralgia, CRPS, and fentanyl pain. The treatment of neuropathic pain is anticonvulsants, carbamazepine, gabapentin, pregabalin, combined with antidepressants, amitriptyline, and duloxetine. Topical agents like capsaicin cream, and opioid and non opioid analgesics, and sympathetic blocks. It is a difficult condition to diagnose and difficult condition to treat also. Trigeminal neuralgia is very, very commonly asked in uh, uh, exams as a short note, and now it is coming as a short case also. And it is typically a painful disorder characterized by brief electric shock like pains, sudden sharp lancinitic pain, abrupt in onset and termination, limited to one or more divisions of trigeminal nerve. Mostly it is unilateral. Just like electricity in sky, there is pain and suddenly you are pain-free. It can be uh, very, very disturbing to the patients and uh, usually it is uh, unilateral and uh, there is very little radiation outside the trigeminal area. Most commonly affected divisions are the second and the third one, the maxillary and mandibular one. And typical character is electric shock like shooting, stabbing, or sharp in intensity, moderate to severe in intensity, and the factors which aggravate are shaving, washing face, air blow, eating, drinking, talking, and it is associated with anxiety, depression, and deterioration in quality of life. We always, always do MRI imaging in such patients, MRI brain to rule out presence of some vascular malformations, cystic tumors, and uh, scleros, multiple sclerosis, or any compression on the trigeminal nerve. So they always done to rule out the other cause. And majority of time, 75 to 80 percent time, it is idiopathic. Treatment first line therapy is either by carbamazepine or uh, oxcarbamazepine, and often a combination of therapy is required over a period of time, combining with dafentin or trigeblin. And we can then subsequently we may have to go for blocks, the diagnostic block of the supraorbital or supratocular uh, nerves, which is the first division, and uh, they can usually done under anatomical landmark guided technique. And associated 
post herpetic neuralgia can also lead on to neuralgia or the supraorbital and supratrochlear nerve and then there can be a pain in the either in the infraorbital nerve region or in the mental one so as it is rightly said that supratrochlear uh, supraorbital and supratrochlear infraorbital and mental all the three nerves lie in one plane and the maxillary and mandibular they are the most common one which are affected and patient will tell that from where the pain is coming and he will just locate that i feel pain either in v2 or v3 and at times in both of them initially you go for a diagnostic block with local anesthetic uh, hitting the lateral pterygoid plate and going superiorly and medially for the maxillary one and posteriorly and uh, probably for the mandibular one and then subsequently you go for radio frequency ablation under fluoroscope guidance so you can either go for a uh pulsed one or you can go for a conventional radio frequency ablation so the difference is basically of the temperature which you are giving and the principle of radio frequency thermocoagulation is selective destruction of pain fibers the a delta and c fibers by thermocoagulation at 65 degree centigrade which helps to reduce pain and prevent prickling the conventional radiography the crf is conventional radio frequency uh, thermocoagulation exposes the target nerves to continuous electrical stimulation and ablates the structure by increasing the temperature around the tip of rf needle so there is a selective destruction of uh, pain carrying fibers and by the radio frequency lesioning in conventional one uh, the temperature is higher around 65 to 70 degrees whereas in pulsed one the there is electric field and the heat burst are delivered at a temperature of 42 degrees and there are uh, the electric stimulation is applied briefly followed by resting phase so there is no continuous one there is an pulsed one impulse break impulse resting phase so that there is uh, no possibility of a structural damage the other one is Uh, cooled uh, radio frequency in which the temperature around the tip is maintained around 60 degrees and there is a wide area of the advantage of cooled radio frequency there is a wide area the area is increased of the uh, ablation of the pain carrying fibers botox uh, not very useful in trigeminal neuralgia commonly used in spasticity especially in pediatric patients of cerebral palsy pain may be in the division of the mandibular nerve only in the inferior alveolar nerve or the mental nerve and you can block them selectively also post herpetic neuralgia very very common entity uh, coming from skin opd it can be at the usual sites the the face or the upper uh, the uh, chest uh, this is this is the common one sites which are which is seen uh, very commonly seen in the opds and the treatment is early acyclovir starting with pregabalin drug of choice amitriptyline because there is lots of burning sensation and tramadol and uh, is commonly used along with uh, capsaicin cream tevilidogram patches are there they have been also tried with uh, good results if it is involving particular nerve like we can go for intercostal nerve blocks if there is a selective dermatome because post herpetic neuralgia follows a particular dermatome you can go for the local nerve blocks and if it is involving multiple dermatomes and giving injections at multiple sites is not possible you can go for a thoracic epidural and at times you go for the deep infiltration of lesions if it is an at an unusual site carnuralgia commonly seen after uh, uh, laparotomies and uh, laparoscopic surgeries complex regional pain syndrome a very very common entity uh, which is seen in crps1 when there is no specific cause is known and crps2 when specific cause of nerve injury is known so it can be either a brachial plexus injury or uh, it can be uh, the common one uh, which is used are uh, the treatment modalities you have exhausted all types of uh, anti epileptic drugs with tramadol and then subsequently you have to go for a diagnostic block or brachial plexus you go for a radio frequency lesioning of a brachial plexus neuropathy Uh, radio frequency uh, lesioning of the brachial plexus and uh, it is done under fluoroscopic guidance if it is following a trauma 
that you can typically see that there are skin changes, nail changes, temperature changes, dystrophic changes, allodynia, hyperalgesia, and like this particular patient putting cold water permanently on his hand because of this burning sensation is there. So if it is, and then you can here see the falling fracture and you can see the nail changes, skin changes, color changes, dystrophic changes, hair changes, they are all are uh, seen in patients with complex renal pain syndrome. Earlier it was known as RSD for reflex sympathetic dystrophy for CRPS1 and causalgia for CRPS2. Because we causalgia, because we knew that definitive, which is the source of uh, nerve injury. We also see patients with phantom pain. Uh, the patient's pain is there in the, the limb which has been amputated. Or there may be a stump pain, only in the stump. So these are all difficult patients which have to be managed and pain relief has to be given. And uh, it can be of upper limb as well as of lower limb. So management is uh, drugs, gabapentin and pregabalin, physiotherapy, psychological therapy and occupational therapy. And followed by, if it is an upper limb, stellate ganglion block, which is, can be done under USG guidance or fluoroscope guidance, C6 stage against tubercle, uh, just above the longest stellae, this is the longest climb muscle and you see the spread of the drug over it. Initially, you go with local anesthetic and then subsequently you go for a radio frequency lesion. So this is done under uh, fluoroscopic guidance. And uh, you have a Horner syndrome also. Uh, you can see that there is a, a grouping of eyelid and color changes. Uh, the skin is uh, red in these patients. Just for passing reference, uh, stellate ganglion is also used for bedside post aneurysm surgery to relieve cerebral spasm and it can be done as a fluoroscope guidance also. And if it is affecting the lower limb, you can go for the lumbar sympathetic block of the lower limb and at the under fluoroscope guidance followed by radio frequency lesion. Our, since our institute is associated with paraplegia, Center also, the lots of patients with cerebral palsy come for spasticity, and we commonly, our role is 10%. We have to release the spasticity, then occupational therapists take over. So, operator nerve block, a diagnostic one under USG guidance and peripheral nerve stimulator guidance, you can do it. And if uh, uh, there is a satisfactory relaxation, you go for a neurotic block with 50% alcohol. Also, these are the all interventions which our postgraduates must be exposed and they should practice majority of them. But they should also know about tense dorsal comb stimulation and deep brain stimulation. So these are the advanced modalities. I'll just briefly touch them that the, there are two modalities, the spinal cord stimulator, which is indicated in failed back pain syndrome, which are unrelative to, unresponsive to the, all the interventions which you have performed if there is severe atonalities or severe neuropathic pain and untreatable complex regional pain syndromes, and you put electronic leads under fluoroscopic guidance at the affected site, and then you stimulate them. And then you, the, our residents must be uh, taught about something about implantable drug delivery pumps, which are the intrathecal pumps when everything else fails uh, uh, for the nociceptive pain, uh, which are the opioid responsive or the neuropathic pain for which higher doses may be required and you put the uh, intrathecal pumps into the uh, subarachnoid space and then you deliver the drugs either uh, and this can be refilled and programmed according to the requirement of the patients. Our agents must be taught about uh, management of special patient groups like elderly, children, disabled, or intellectually handicapped and those unable to communicate. Pain management in elderly, I'll just briefly touch because these are the big set of patients which are coming to us and we must know that they do not report pain much. They tend to bear pain and they are associated with numerous uh, causes related to age related also, whether it is degenerative disease, fractures, neuropathic pain, post-stroke pain, post-herbatic neuralgia. And we have to see that they are Physiological changes are there in almost all organ functions, whether it is kidneys, whether it is liver, whether it is lungs, they have to be taken into account. Coexisting disease, hypertension, ischemic heart disease, diabetes, COPD, 
so we have to treat the patient such patients very cautiously and also uh, our resident must be talk about drug dependency and drug addiction also a word passing reward about the pandemic and chronic pain see treatment of chronic pain should not be stopped uh, during pandemic it is an essential service because any disruption in pain practice will have alarming consequences for the individuals for the healthcare systems and providers but while treating we have to take care that we the anesthesiologists are taking care of the covid pandemic also we are already overtly burdened so those patients uh, those doctors who are posted in pain clinics they should they they should not be too much burden also and telemedicine has come up as an uh, promising tool in chronic pain management during covid pandemic especially for the follow up patients not for the initial one but for the follow up patients and it can be concluded that we come to redesign healthcare services after the pandemic maybe telemedicine would be another model of care with patients with chronic pain especially for follow ups so i know i have been speaking for long these all are the implications for anesthesiologists we can build an exclusive career in pain medicine because we are well versed with the art and science of treating pain and i repeat our role as pain physician is a natural extension of our professional work the curriculum has been designed by nmc and mci now onus is on hods of anesthesiology and in charge of pain clinics and pain management centers that the post graduates are imparted proper teaching and training in chronic pain management there are modalities different teaching and training in pain medicines like one year fellowships and certificate courses in pain medicines like pdcs and post doctoral fellowships in bhu sgpgi varanasi and lucknow maharashtra university of health sciences and dy patel dm in pain medicine in aims uh, dehradun and numerous fellowships by world federation for society of anesthesiologists australian new zealand college of anesthesiologists iasp issp fipp and cips and these are the courses which are being conducted especially by iassp the fellowship of indian academy of pain medicine fiapm is being conducted in india different centers and yes the newer avenues are fnb in pain medicine this has been approved by the national board of examination it is a two years dedicated fnb program in pain medicine as a convener of specialist board of uh, anesthesiologist i am very happy that with this was i was able to done do, get it done along with my team and i am very sure that in the coming june exam of neat super faculty fnb pain medicine uh, will be the part so very hopeful that in 2022 june it will come and this is personally gratifying to me as convener this was a long sort of dream which has been fulfilled uh, in 2020 and the centers are being accredited and it will soon be launched there and it is a dedicated two year program keeping in mind the healthcare setup and anesthesiology with post graduate certifications like da md or dnb that is compulsory and minimum requirement and next is definitely to have a, a dm in pain medicine at all institutes which is nmc improvement and having separate independent departments of pain medicine so to summarize chronic pain management comes with challenges you see all set of patients from rural to ministers from poor to rich you perform from basic to advanced interventions and immediate to delayed interventions some patients may require block today some you can do it after two months also there are good avenues for clinical exposure training and teaching research and establishing pain medicine as a super specialty and most most importantly you get lots and lots of blessings of patients when you relieve the patients of their pain they bless you and i can tell you your works are done you progress in life and their blessings can take you to numerous heights so we should master our competencies of patient care medical knowledge practice evidence based learning and keep on improving ourselves develop interpersonal skills communication skills of talking to the patients be professional in our approach and follow systems based practice to conclude being a doctor requires the balancing the roles of empathetic listener expert and authority we should not be only a compassionate listener who puts his patients at ease but are also able to establish authority as a doctor 
when the situation demands. We not only demonstrate expertise at the level of our clinical skills, but also adapt at evaluating patients inside and becoming an ally of the patient. To conclude, I always say this is Matki of brain, uh, pain, the Dai Handi festival, which is celebrated. So it relies on a solid foundation of a good history taking, very nice examination, appropriate investigations and timely intervention. Then only this matki of pain can be broken, and this is a holistic approach. Then only you can break this matki of pain. All these pictures are not of my own. It is my pain team, uh, which is working with me day in and day out. Uh, they are working with me in the pain OTs and in pain clinics. And uh, uh, over the years, they have been working both boys and girls. And, uh, in the OPDs, this is the old picture when no masks were there. And we refer, uh, routinely conduct international pain management workshops also. So finally, to my dear ones who wish to start career in pain medicine, one day or day one, you decide. Don't wait for one day. Start today as day one and start your career in pain medicine. Because magic is believing in yourself. If you can make that happen, you can make anything happen. There are three mantras of success in life, which I follow. And I request that you should also follow honesty, sincerity, and hard work. There are no substitutes to these three mantras. I bow down my head in front of all my teachers and parents because of whose blessings I am sitting in front of you and talking about chronic pain management. As it has been rightly said that we have not lost faith in God, but we have transferred it from God to the medical profession. Thank you for your patient work. Thank you so much, sir. That was uh, such a lucid and such a beautiful description. You have the blessings of your patients, sir, parents, and you have the gratitude of the whole anesthesia fraternity not just for the work that you have done for the anesthesiologist of uh, India and a very big uh, thank you and congratulations for the FNB pain medicine that has uh, started recently. Regarding the lecture, sir, it was a very lucid description and uh, it, was, it was so easy flowing because you were talking and discussing things that you do. Uh, even the symptoms that you showed of the patients, there were pictures uh, of your institute. So congratulations to your whole team, I mean, I'm sure PJ Rotak is doing great work with the pain, pain management there. Uh, I don't see very many questions, sir. Uh, if you allow, there is one question yeah. uh, that was posted by Dr. Ankush. Uh, he just wanted to know the difference between breakthrough pain and incident pain. Incident pain is basically a subtype of breakthrough pain in which but pain does not occur at rest. It occurs at a movement, whether it is a voluntary movement or involuntary movement, but usually at rest, pain is not there. So it is a type of uh, breakthrough pain. Yes, the, the pain that occurs uh, with activities such as eating, defecating, socializing or walking, that could be called incident pain. But if, if you, it won't be there at rest. Yes, yes, yes. And uh, breakthrough pain, sir? Breakthrough pain is... Breakthrough pain can occur at any time uh, and it is usually associated with an activity, usually seen in patients who are on cancer pain treatment, uh, suppose they are on uh, regular treatment and suddenly uh, the patient feels pain and our modality should be that we should add another drug and ensure that the drug is taken at the drug with the patient is taking is taken at a regular interval and add another drug to treat the breakthrough pain. Aggressively treat the breakthrough pain. Yes, sir. So the pain that comes before the next dose of the uh, analgesic dose uh, that 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 can be classified as breakthrough. We can okay. increase that. You said we can give it at regular intervals or decrease the you know, frequency. Uh, increase the frequency. Usually, uh, uh, suppose morphine for coronary cancer pain is given at six hourly interval and pain is happening at the fourth hour. So you have to decrease the interval to the fourth hour. And uh, at times, you may have to increase the dose also, frequency also, or add another drug also. Right, sir. Right, sir. Perfect. Uh, I mean, I'm sure everybody is very highly appreciative of the excellent talk. And uh, I mean, this is not just for the postgraduate, sir. A lot of 
mid, even mid level consultants they are not uh, very exposed to, uh, to chronic pain during the training so this lecture would serve as a very nice template to know what all uh, uh, should be know what should the postgraduates know regarding chronic pain and uh, you have also mentioned the nmc uh, directives what they should be knowing uh, very frequently as as you progress through the lecture so uh, I do not see many oh, questions. AC Patel I... is uh, uh, AC Patel has uh, raised hand. Okay, so so what I'll do is I'll uh, uh, allow everybody to unmute themselves. So uh, AC Patel, uh, Doctor AC Patel has raised his hand. Uh, Doctor Patel, can you unmute yourself? Dr. Patel, can you uh, unmute yourself, please? So there's a question by Dr. Nina Tripathi, how to assess pain in the neonates? See, it's absolutely different topic. Assessment of pain no. in neonates, uh, uh, usually uh, it, it, it is only by observing and talking to the parents. Neonates, we're talking about neonates, how the, as I've told that uh, verbal, they won't be verbating anything. So if there's excessive crying or there is uh, altered uh, diet profile or a nauseating feeling, then only we have to rely on it. Right. But to be honest, uh, patients coming in our pain clinics, neonates, uh, I'm, I'm not treating uh, neonates with chronic pain. I must say that. Though it is a busy pain center, but neonatal chronic pain, uh, our exposure is not that much. So, Dr. Patel, Agnihotri, sir, uh, can you admit yourself? I think he's raised his hand, Dr. Agnihotri. Sir, Pranam, sir. Good evening, sir. Namaskar, sir. Uh, yes, congratulations for wonderful lecture on the chronic pain. I must, my memory gone back to 50 years back. When I was taking this lecture, I was sum up only with the four words. That is the pain is a pain. P for perception. A for assessment, I for investigation, and N for neutrality. That was my motto to tease the pain. And you took so much of time to take the pain. It has become chronic pain for all. Uh, my wishes, the young generation should learn the art of pain management. Because in my time, it was only the cancer patient's pain was relieved by intervention, mostly. And I was doing all sorts of blocks, what you have described, celiac and maxillary mandibular, all these things and epidural. But heads off to your description of the pain and its management. I wish the young generation should come up with this concepts. Thank you very much. God bless. Thank you, sir. Your blessings mean a lot to me, sir. Personally also, sir. Thank you. Sir, can I ask one question, please? Yes, Dr. Nina. Uh, sir, how to decide whether we will do fluoroscopic guided uh, block or ultrasound uh, guided block? When to use ultrasound for blocking a nerve? Sir? When to use fluoroscope? Uh, so that's a very practical question. Uh, I can say that in uh, we I have been trained more with uh, fluoroscope uh, during my period, and ultrasound came late. But uh, last decade or so, we have been using ultrasound also regularly uh, for both the blocks. But suppose where you know that your spread of drug will be hidden beyond the bone, uh, like you are very sure that your drug will go into the epidural compartment, but whether it will reach up to the affected space or not, then uh, you go for a fluoroscopic guidance. But definitely with fluoroscope guidance also, I will say that you have to take certain precautions of radiation hazards, that minimum exposure has to be given. You have to be wearing coveralls and uh, thyroid guard at least of 0.5 mm thickness. And also uh, while the shooting is going on, the C arm should have a collimation so that you and your team is not affected much. That means the spread of the drugs, uh, spread of the rays is uh, restricted uh, over the uh, patient only and you are almost one meter away at that time. But definitely it's a personal choice. Some are uh, some pain solutions are very comfortable doing uh, UAG guidance. Others are very comfortable doing fluoroscope guidance. 
both are good modalities of uh, reaching the drug uh, at the target site those involving musculoskeletal are commonly done with fluoroscope guidance other if there are peripheral nerves they are come more with uhg guidance so sir all blocks which are done under fluoroscopy can also be done with ultrasound and vice versa yes yes uh, it is vice versa absolutely there are few blocks which cannot be done otherwise all the blocks which can be done under fluoroscope can be done with uhg guidance also you have to basically learn the sonar anatomy of uh, that thank you sir my, Dr. Balbi. Yes, sir. Dr. Balbi. Balbi. Sir is my guru. I must say, uh, whatever I have learned in anesthesia, uh, it is all because of his teachings. And uh, sir is our father figure of PGMF Rotak. And uh, uh, he is a perfect human being. Even if you become 1% like him, our life will be a Sir, I bow my head to you, sir. Thank you. <clears throat> I am very honest. This is the only specialty where you get the blessing of the patient. I think I have seen blessing of the patient when you manage the pain and so on. And I thanks Dr. Naveen for making an excellent department of the pain also. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Vishwanath, sir, you are in. Uh, uh, Naveen, sir, excellent talk. Uh, definitely. It is uh, useful for the post one, one thing I want to do is post to take the message that the pain is a fifth vital sign. They have to. And next, uh, uh, about the ozone therapy, a little bit I wanted them to know about this. One. Otherwise, you have covered everything. Excellent. And uh, congratulations. Thank you. Sir. As a matter of fact, sir, in institutes, ozone therapy is uh, not allowed. So I have not covered it uh, because uh, we had conducted certain, submitted some research projects also. So they said it is, it is uh, not published in the medical literature. So in institutes, in our institutes, uh, ozone therapy is not allowed. Sir. So okay, but sir, yes. but, but uh, it, is, it is used in fibromyalgia. It is used yes. in particular injection of the knee joint. And it is used uh, for the uh, transformal nerve blocks and uh, injection into the disc also. So they, it, is, it is used and people are used, doing it. But I am personally in our institute. In medical colleges and teaching hospital, it is not allowed, sir. Uh, I was with uh, Dr. Dureja, sir. Yes. And uh, you know, he yes, was doing a lot of uh, this one. Yes, in, <laughs> and, uh, in, in private, okay. sir, you can yes. do it, sir. And yes. uh, I have also learned from him. The yes. purity has to be taken care. Yes. <coughs> that the purity of the ozone is maintained. And it is a yes. outdoor procedure. You can generate the ozone generation yes. machine is there. Yes. And uh, you can easily inject uh, uh, into the intraarticular compartment, combining with local anesthetic and ozone also. So, and then you can uh, mix it. Okay, sir. So, Dr. GVSL Anuradha wants to know uh, regarding uh, the periphery, what is the better modality to use in the periphery? I think uh, uh, difference uh, uh, choice is between ultrasound and... Uh... Uh, in periphery, I can say that if you're alone, so investing uh, USG machine uh, minimum will cost 10 to 15 lakh rupees. And you can tie up with a urology center or an orthopedic center and uh, give him uh, on the case basis subsequently before you venture for your own uh, fluoroscope which uh, a good one cost that also cost around 15 to 20 lakh rupees so better initially will be because usg in periphery will require a pcp injury clearance and uh, which you have to take and the machine cannot be shifted anywhere else so you have to go there and perform the blocks and uh, uh, you have to maintain all the records also so in periphery, if you're working alone, you can work after tying up with some urologist or an or orthopedician. 
So uh, 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 we are we as anesthetists are getting uh, PCP PNDT, PNDT uh, permits for ultrasound machines, sir. Yes, sir. Definitely, it is it, it is it is legally allowed, and uh, we are in in our institute. We have got in anesthesia department five ultrasound machines, and they are uh, having in different parts. Whether it is in the ICUs, in the OTs, whether it is in different ICUs. Now, COVID uh, the purchases were more, so. Uh, for COVID, it is separate. For uh, first floor ICU, separate. The third floor ICU, separate. OT is separate. So you can do all kind of ultrasound guided uh, blocks also, vascular access, assessment of the lung, assessment of uh, echo also, uh, deep vein thrombosis, gastric volume, all things they can be done with USG. So in institutes, uh, there is a procedure. The, all the consultants, they submit their uh, degrees and their uh, ID cards. And the dark card and individual affidavits are signed and submitted to the uh, civil uh, chief medical officer of the civil hospital, and you get a PCP and it clearance, and you put a board also that uh, there is no uh, such determination is done outside all the working areas. So it is legally allowed in institutes to have USG machine under the name of anesthesiologists. And what about the periphery, sir? Uh, is that the same? Also it is allowed, but but then you have to. Uh, uh, you are you will be using alone so, so you that you should have that much workload and if you're suppose your husband wife are there your wife is a gynecologist and she has got a usg machine you can take a pcp and clearance with that but you cannot move out of that cabin you have okay. to ensure that so usg machine is not a portable one yes. so your ot should be beside that thing and okay. yes definitely you can have a pcp and clearance for performing usg guided nerve blocks no confusion about that and is there any government order that we are exempted from PNDT? This has been asked. No, by no, 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 no. There is no exemption. Please, uh, there is. Uh, you are uh, no. Nobody is exempted. You have to take a PCP entry clearance, whether you are in government, whether you are in your AIMS, whether you are in PGI. You have to take PCP entry clearance. No exemption for anybody. Doctor A C Patel, uh, he has raised his hand. Uh, sir, can you unmute? Doctor Srinath Tripathi also want, wanted to ask something. Hello, sir. Yes. Hello. Yes, yeah. yes, Doctor Patel, please. Sir, PRP therapy for patients own PRP or we can get from the blood bank? No, sir, it is an autologous, sir. You, you, auto blood. Can, it is an autologous blood and uh, yeah. it can be prepared either by your own PRP machine, which we have, yeah. or if you don't have your PRP machine, you can get it prepared in the blood bank also. If you are, uh, you can just tell them. And uh, uh, it is autologous blood only, sir. It is autologous, not from the other people. No, 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 sir. Ne ne please, no, 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 never. <laughs> okay, okay, sir. Thank you, sir. For you. Okay, thank you, sir. Dr. Nina Tripathi, madam. Yes, sir. Uh, anesthesiologist is uh, necessary, uh, degree of anesthesia is necessary to start pain clinic or plain MBBS student. No, no sir. Uh, and, uh, for pain clinic, you can be, uh, uh, super, uh, have some uh, specialization. I'm not saying that only anesthesiologists can practice pain, but uh, it, right now in India, 90% uh, of uh, pain management, chronic pain management is done by anesthesiologists. MBBS, I'm not sure. Uh, Sir, if someone do like uh, from pain, Dardia Pain Clinic, uh, uh, the fellowship course is basic advanced, then they're uh, entitled to start their uh, pain clinic after MBBS? At the end of the day, you have to justify it Yes, your training are there that you have given a reasonable level of care. And uh, if your treatment modality was safe, then and you've under, undergone uh, training at uh, such centers, that is valid. After uh, doing training, definitely you can uh, do, and these trainings are uh, valid as of now. So, what are the MCI recognized pain diplomas or fellowships? Uh, uh, right now, uh, we are working on once this FNB will start. It will be MCA recognized. Rest all are university recognized. Uh, DM uh, at AIMS Rishikesh, uh, because it's an autonomous institute, AIMS degree is automatically recognized. So that is a separate thing. Otherwise, uh, all these PDCCs and uh, these are covering, they are all university recognized and uh, they are good uh, postdoctoral fellowships and uh, uh, postdoctoral certificate courses. They, are, they all get university recognition. Thank you. So, uh, sir, yes. I don't. May I ask a question? After DA, yes, you, we can start. 
somebody has asked uh, can we start pain clinic with only da yes da dnb md you can start no issues with that then may i ask a question yes madam uh, sir when few uh, interventions pain interventions if someone gets uh, um, covid like especially in uh, three third wave मैं माइकुन क्या था निशान क्वेश्चन कोविड इफ समवन गेट्स कोविड पॉजिटिव एस्पेशियली थर्ड वेव व्हेन वी कैन कॉल हिम फॉर इलेक्टिव इंटरवेंशन लाइक पीआरपी नी मैम दिस इज अ वेरी प्रैक्टिकल क्वेश्चन इन टुडे सेटअप एंड एसिम्टोमेटिक पेशेंट्स मे आल्सो बी कोविड पॉजिटिव एट द टाइम ऑफ द दिस थिंग सो दैट टू बी ऑन अ साइड once the patient is tested negative i do it after two weeks to be on a safer side so that okay. those patients who have uh, were asymptomatic and managed at home who were Thank asymptomatic you. and managed at home, home so that they are all whatever the inflammatory things would have been there in the body they would have settled down and uh, uh, they the myalgia the weakness uh, they would have uh, gone and they would be in good health no prp uh, will won't affect anything but still you are going to put the needle uh, either into the knee joint or the shoulder joint so yes if they were asymptomatic you can do it after two weeks okay thank you sir oh uh, thank you so much sir i don't see uh, any other question uh, dr anjali ma'am is here dr anjali bhure ma'am ma'am if you could uh, just thank you nishant thank you ma'am dr navin sir it was really an eye opener and almost each segment of the pain section was discussed and uh, we are so happy it was a good learning experience thank you nishan over absolutely. to you yes ma'am absolutely ma it was uh, anjali and uh, nishan and i must say for that uh, i am really happy that both dr anjali gore madam and dr nishan are here uh, in spite of their uh, Uh, some uh, covid related issues uh, they are uh, here in the talk and i appreciate and place it on record uh, your uh, sincerity for the isc online pg classes uh, thank you very much sir thank you so much sir so uh, uh, it has been absolutely wonderful sir i mean really not just the talk but uh, how the talk should be how the presentation should be for a young faculty like us uh that that was also something that i very keenly followed so uh, uh with your permission sir some uh, dr neena is asking for my mobile number uh, anyhow i have typed it on the uh, chat box and uh, now i come to my original role uh with this we come to the conclusion of today's class on chronic pain management and next week on 7th february we shall be having uh, isa online class on anesthetic considerations for a major uh, ortho patient scheduled for an orthopedic surgery except tkr and thr which will be taken on 14th february so next week dr surinder sharma for medanta institute of orthopedics will be talking about anesthetic considerations of a patient scheduled for orthopedic surgery and 14th february will be uh, on valentines day by dr kk mubarak from kerala anesthetic considerations for thr and tkr Thank you very much for a patient listening. Long live ISC. Thank you. 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 Thank you.